I'm Brenda Timbrugenkate. I'm with the Santa Fe Springs Department of Fire Rescue, and I'd like to thank my co-presenter, David Noren from EBA Engineering for his perspective uh, as a contractor. I'm here to offer you my perspective as a regulator. So there's basically three main categories I'm gonna be speaking of today, and one of them is the regulatory requirements. So I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the laws, codes, and regulations that pertain to underground storage tank removal. But just a side note, I've set up my slides. They're intended to be more like a cliff note style, so you can refer back to the code sections after the presentation, because it's extremely boring to listen to presenters just recite code. But it's very important, because as regulators, without those codes, we wouldn't be out on these tank removal jobs in the first place. But we're really gonna focus on the safety and the logistics at a tank removal site, and really, I am gonna talk about the stuff you're not gonna find when you go back and look at, at the COOPA regulations. Because the COOPA regulations that we implement really don't speak to a lot of the safety issues that we have to address. Title 22 and Title 23 of the California Health and Safety Code um, is where the COOPA's authority lie. And a lot of the safety issues come either out of the fire code, which I'm fortunate enough to implement. Um, we use the 2013 California Fire Code. But COOPAs are also run by health departments and um, some of the safety issues are actually more related to OSHA. And I am not an OSHA inspector, but the reality is as a re tank removal inspector, I've seen hundreds of tanks come out of the ground and I can name on one hand how many times I've seen another agency inspector on site. So you're gonna be faced with observing safety issues and it's, um, the goal of my presentation to share with you my experiences for the workarounds with that. Uh, you may also have air districts dealing with your UST removal or permitting them. In the Los Angeles area, we have the South Coast Air Quality Management District and they require permits for products and waste that have certain vapor pressures. So I often refer to this as degassing, it's technically vapor recovery. Um, and we'll talk about the vapor recovery person's role on the job site as well. And then of course the building department, they permit tank removals, they also deal with shoring. We don't approve shoring plans, but as a tank inspector, you're gonna be on sites where it may be necessary. So here's where I want you to refer back to the slide. I'm not gonna go over the details, but just know that the health and safety code is the law that requires underground tank removals. And in the health and safety code, article seven, um, is where there is a general overview of the key points you have to demonstrate uh, when you remove an underground tank. And if you have not read it, I encourage you to read it. It's about three pages long, it's very short, and it's pretty easy for, for regulation reads, so make sure you do that. And one of the things Title 23 does is it gives a lot of leeway to the local agency to dictate the time frames in which you have to submit a, a, a work plan. And often um, the local agency may modify what's in the health and safety code. So it's imperative for every jurisdiction that their uh, particular procedures be, be checked for contractors because it can vary from agency to agency. And then I also wanna point out Title 22 deals with all of the cleaning and the hazardous waste requirements. There's one section I wanna point out specifically because it's also an important read, and it's even shorter than Article 7, maybe a page or two at best, but it's Section 67383.3, and basically it talks about the procedures that can be used to clean a tank system. And of course, I just mentioned local ordinance. Title 23 will have a requirement, and then the very last part of the sentence will say, as required by the local agency or as demonstrated to the local agency. So again, local requirements are very important when it comes to tank removal. And of course, by now we all know the fire code has permit requirements for tank removal. And although Title 23 allows the agency to set the time frame in which that tank must be removed, the fire code does have a one year limitation. Okay, so why do all of these codes, laws, regulations exist, it's because underground tank removal is inherently dangerous. And to that point, I'd like to show you a brief one minute video. It's, it's actually at a tank lining job. So you can see that there's um, a couple of man waste dumps there. One is open and I'm gonna play this for you here. 
and it just stresses the importance of one of the key safety factors at tank removal, and that is making sure that the interior atmosphere of that tank is rid of any potential flammability issues. It's key that that tank be properly cleaned and inerted if required, because the consequences are severe, as shown here. So I want you to keep your eye on the worker at the bottom left corner of the screen. He's putting an internal inspection camera into a sump, and he's preparing to enter it. There's no audio to this, but I'm just gonna uh, be quiet as he begins to enter the tank and observe what happens. So obviously the interior atmosphere had not been properly addressed. And I'm happy to report this gentleman is alive, but obviously not without injury. So there's a couple things that, that to me are quite obviously wrong just being in the field that I'm in. That gentleman's making a confined space entry. He's not underneath a tripod. He doesn't have the harness on. He is so fortunate that an explosion blew him backwards into a backflip because had he fallen into the tank, you just had an explosion consume all of the oxygen in the bottom of the tank, and obviously there's a hazardous condition in there to say the least. So make sure your tanks are properly inerted. Last thing you want is your tank catching on fire. But what about crane safety? Do you want to be the inspector on site when this happens at your job? Of course not. So I am not a professional crane person, but I'm going to talk to you about some of my observations and my workarounds for addressing with cranes when I start to get that uncomfortable feeling. Oops, I'm sorry, I used the wrong uh, advancer. Do I, do I need to go back? Okay. So what about riding in the backhoe bucket? Looks like a lot of fun, right? Of course, it almost looks like a giant Ferris wheel, but of course it's absolutely not a, an appropriate workspace to be in. I've actually had geologists ask me if they can go in the backhoe to the bottom of the excavation to collect the soil sample because the arm of the backhoe cannot reach it. So there's a multitude of problems with that. A, you can't ride in the backhoe. B, now you're entering confined space, which is a, a, a deep excavation. So. Entering an underground tank excavation is not a safe thing to do. Dave spoke briefly about the confined space rules. I would love to have an OSHA inspector teach this class and also maybe an idea for next year's conference is have a confined space um, presentation because there's confined space all the time on tank removals. And the fact of the matter is, workers cannot be in there without the proper precautions. There's confined space entry permits. There's the issue of, of um, shoring, so you don't address those things, you could be this guy. It's important that the stabilization of the, of the sidewalls are evaluated and they can be unconsolidated or not, the risk of sidewall collapse is real. So make sure it's properly shored. Does this look like proper shoring? Of course not. I love this slide. I got this as a, like a, uh, one of those emails you forward with jokes, and I pulled this, the picture out of it because I thought it was really funny. And why do I know this is not approved shoring? Because common sense tells you that. So don't forget to gauge on your common sense when you're dealing with underground tank removals. So the Koopa uses the permit to make sure there's some level of competence and planning involved with addressing an underground tank. And there's some key points you have to address in doing that. Primarily, you have to provide safe removal procedures. And it's not just removing the tank. You're required to move the piping as well, unless there's some kind of permanent structure that could be damaged in the course of doing so. And the piping, it needs to be drained of all free-flowing liquids and capped on each end if it's allowed to remain in place. But any liquids that are generated, you have to legally manage those. That's where your hazardous waste rules come in. And of course, we talked about making sure the tank's properly cleaned and inerted, and a sampling plan should be part of the, the permit as well. And the permit is supposed to contain details on the tank, what size it is, what it contained, uh, but 
a lot of that information now is done through SIRS, and the tank information form and the tank facility information form are going to contain your RPs or your responsible parties and contact information. Uh, as far as contractor licensing, the State Water Board has published a wonderful local guidance letter. It's LG48-5. I provided the link to that local guidance letter there, and you can refer to it to see what kind of contractor licensing are allowed to remove underground tanks. So permit applications can vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and I find generally there's two ways the permit is done. Either a written work plan is submitted, or the agency has prescriptive forms. And personally, I am a huge fan of prescriptive forms. As a person who has to review these work plans, it provides a level of uniformity, so it all kind of looks similar, but it decreases the plan review time. If someone um, uses our permit package, I typically approve those closure permits and I assign the sampling on the spot uh, in 20 minutes. So it's great because there's, there's no review time. Contractors don't have to wait. They just call, make an appointment, and we do it over the counter. However, we are also flexible. So even though we have prescriptive forms, we do allow for them to submit a written work plan to identify any differences from your typical tank procedure that are identified in our forms. So contractors need to determine when that agency requires the inspector to be present. Can you hand me the water? Right there. Thank you. And in Santa Fe Springs, we required that we be present for the clean certification. However, the inspection starts before you arrive at the job site. Before you even leave the office, pull the permit, review it. Make sure you know what kind of um, hazards are contained in the tanks, what product was in there before. Make sure you know how many tanks you're going to witness be removed. Be familiar with the sampling plan. And in general, know the hazards that you may expect to encounter. But always, always, bring work with you because when the logistics don't go seamlessly, there can be downtime. And just like Dave brings his favorite chair, I'll go ahead and bring some secondary containment test results I need to review or some other you know, return to compliance document. And if you're lucky enough to have a laptop and an internet connection, I know you have SIR submittals sitting in your in-basket waiting to be reviewed. So as you approach the site, observe the wind conditions. Underground tank removal sites are often very busy construction sites with a lot of dust on them. Park up wind and try to anticipate the traffic flow in and out of the job site because they may have the, the waste hauler or the tank degasser that still needs to leave the job site. And the last thing you want to do is park your inspector car where it's blocking their exit. So stay out of the way. As you're approaching the scene, see how it is protected from the public. So, you know, are you at a very busy retail gas station where there's pedestrian traffic? Or are you at the back of a giant distribution facility where the whole site is privately fenced? Observe if there's fencing, if there's cones, and at times I'm even asked to sign a site entry log. And as an inspector, if you're asked to sign a site entry log, do not be offended. You should be impressed because to me, that's a testament to that contractor's perspective on safety. However, be aware of what you're signing because sometimes those access logs will say that by signing, you have read certain SOPs that that contractor has and if they're not available to you or you haven't read them, talk to the person asking you to sign it and I've, I'll sign and I'll make a little modification um, to it so it actually is correct with what I'm doing there. I've had, um, site entry logs where they've asked me for my driver's license. And unless it's some kind of secret military operation, I, I don't typically give that up. Okay, so we promised to talk to you about logistics. I'm gonna talk about equipment logistics, and I'm also gonna talk about people logistics, because they're both important. So as you're approaching, observe the equipment on site and how it's staged. When I pull up, if I see the crane's not there, I already know I'm gonna be reviewing some, some extra work I brought with me, because it can take some time to set that up. But try and see what's missing. And you want to, um, if the crane is there, observe the position of the crane relative to the excavation. You wanna make sure that it's set back far enough. Look at the overhead hazards. Is there electrical nearby? 
And you also want to kind of envision what the path of that underground tank will be at as it's removed from the excavation and placed on the loading truck. Are the, are, is the back truck still there? Is the degasser there? If they're still there, talk to them. And also see if the geologist is on site. Uh, but go ahead and try and envision how this tank is going to come out of the ground and be transported off site. So to me, this is a very good looking site. When I walk up and a site looks like this, it gives me an increased level of comfort with that contractor because I'm observing a couple of things. First of all, there's only two contractors in this, or I should say workers, in this photograph. There's actually a third one behind the crane on the other side of this guideline, but the first thing I observed, they're wearing their high visibility safety vests and their hard hats. The next thing I see is that there is fencing all around the excavation and the access points in and out are identified with cones. I see that the truck is already there that's going to take that tank off site, um, but also in the far distance, I see electrical lines clearly um, a safe distance apart from reaching any part of the extension of the crane arm. A little side note is this worker here is at the intersection of the driveway to the company and a public street which runs here. He actually has a stop sign in his hand because he's halting the traffic as the tank is being actively lifted from the excavation. And the other thing I observe is that it looks like this tank's coming around the front and over to the back somewhere of this uh, diesel truck and there's nothing underneath it. It has a clear pathway. So the tank's moved on to the back of the truck and ultimately they're going to secure this, remove debris, and uh, transport the tank off site. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the people logistics. And an underground tank removal site is much like a chessboard. And the people working on it, they're quite like chess pieces. In fact, when you play chess, what is the highest ranking piece in a game of chess? The king, thank you. I'm like, am I the only one who plays chess here? <laughs> it's the king. And the king of the tank removal site is your RP, your responsible party. Because without an RP, that tank removal is not going to happen. However, the RP sometimes are not even at the job site. And if they are, they don't move around a lot. Except for the first move, the king kind of only moves one direction, one space. So it's much like the tank owner. But what is your most valuable piece that you just hate to lose when you're in a, a match of chess? The queen, right. Why? Because it can perform all jobs. It's very versatile. It's all over the place. And the queen of the underground tank removal site is your site safety officer. I like to say it's me, but I'm just the observer of the chess match. <laughs> uh, just kidding. But um, the site safety officer, in my opinion, is the most valuable worker on a tank removal site. That role is often shared by the site supervisor or the project manager. And I will use those three terms interchangeably, but um, introduce yourself to that person ask permission to take pictures. You already have permission to be there because they scheduled an appointment with, with you for the removal. And ask them if they're ready. Where are they at in the tank removal process? Are they ready to demonstrate that tank is clean? So see if those relative people are on site yet. So another uh, person that would be on a job site often doesn't have a lot to contribute towards the actual work zone. And those are your looky-loos. Um, I find that the looky-loos, they're much like the pawns on the chessboard because they start way back and as things get more interesting, they move forward a little bit and then they move forward a little bit and um, they need to be kept at a safe distance because you really don't need eight people standing over the excavation. They're not really contributing anything to the active work zone and you want to prevent them from experiencing any hazards. So talk to your project manager, ask if there's any changes from the permit, see if the contractors or subs have changed and you have to deal with your own internal processes um, in, in terms of something like that happens. I would expect a, a good contractor to know they need to file a permit addendum and, and deal with that beforehand. Uh, but also confirm if they're still looking at a non-hazardous or hazardous removal. We require they stipulate that on the permit and sometimes this scenario happens. The contractor approaches me and said, you know, we're having a hard time getting the tank clean. We can't get the tank clean. Can, 
can we pull it out anyway? It's like, well, you're looking at a, a hazardous removal. Well, there's a lot of pre-planning that contractors do. I appreciate all the work they do before we even get there. But chances are that the transportation truck that's supposed to take that tank to its disposal facility is probably not a licensed hazardous waste hauler, and they probably weren't planning to go to a TSDF, they're probably planning to go to some kind of recycling facility. So that's a major change. So you need to assess and record any of those differences from the permit. Ask the contractor to give you a verbal explanation of how that tank's coming out and how he views the staging to be and compare it with some of the things I spoke with earlier. Use your common sense and always be aware of your surroundings. So the site safety officer. I like to stay within sound and sight of the site safety officer. One of the reasons is because there is a lot of noise on a tank removal site. And when you need to get the attention of a crane operator or a backhoe operator, honestly, they don't see you, even though you're the inspector, as much as they can see or hear their contractor, because it's been my experience that they have certain whistles and motions that really get their attention fast. So I usually will report safety concerns to the site safety officer and address them that way. But the key thing I want to stress is to try to strive for cooperation, through, for compliance through cooperation. Because especially now, we have a, a lot of the same tank contractors that remove tanks, are doing monitor certs, and you see these people over and over again. So it's important to develop good business relationships with them. But if you walk on a job site and people are not wearing hard hats, and you ask them to put them on, make sure you're wearing one yourself. Make sure you practice what you preach. I get teased for a little bit for being a nerd in the fire department because I always put my hard hat and my, my vest on no matter what when I'm, when I'm on the public street. And um, when you do it, you just don't ever forget and it sets a good example. But what if you're still met with someone who's still uncooperative? I found that by asking one question, I generally can gain compliance almost every time. And if I see someone in the excavation uh, that's not um, supposed to be in there, I will ask them to, to, if they could please remove the person from the excavation. And if they, they do one of two things, they either immediately comply because they didn't know, or they're caught and they'll have them come out. Or um, they kind of shrug their shoulders and just say, oh, he's only going to be in there for a little while. Well, that's not really okay. It only takes a little while for something to go wrong. So I'll ask them, can you please show me where that activity is allowed in your health and safety plan? And almost every time they never get the health and safety plan out and they kind of shake their head and then they'll go ahead and comply with what you're requesting because they know it's not in their health and safety plan. And the great thing about that is it removes a little bit of pressure from you as the inspector because it's their own site-specific health and safety plan that doesn't allow it. So it's almost like it didn't come from you, it's their own procedures. But what if they're still uncooperative? I, again, going back to the person in the excavation, this was on a tank installation actually, but he still, um, he was a really grumpy guy and he was not interested in me asking that worker to be removed from the excavation. So finally, I, I had to actually take out my cell phone and I told him, okay, I'm calling OSHA right now. I'm gonna hand the phone to you. And if you can get an OSHA inspector on the line to tell me that what your worker is doing is okay, I will back off. And the last thing a contractor wants is another inspector calling OSHA to come out on a concern. So at that point, we gained compliance. But finally, as a last resort, if you are a fire department, you have stop work authority. You can stop any work that, you, that the fire code official finds to be unsafe or dangerous, and that's in section 111.1 of the 2013 fire code. But what about health departments that don't have, I don't know if health departments have stop work authority or not, but a very manipulative way of working around this issue is you could threaten to walk off the job site or not sign off the permit. And thank goodness I haven't had to ever deal with that on a, a tank removal site, but um, you know, this is really a last resort. The, the idea is to work with the contractors to make sure your comfort level as an inspector is satisfied. So we're gonna talk to a variety of people before the tank comes out. We're gonna talk to the vacuum truck driver, if he's still there. 
If he's there, try and record the manifest number. You're gonna wanna see a copy of that manifest signed by the TSDF in the UST removal report. If the vapor recovery guy is there, my first issue or concern is why is he still there? We come when the tank is clean, he should be done. So usually it's one of two things, either they were running late or they actually are having trouble getting the tank clean. So work, work that out with the contractor. You wanna to talk to the person that's certifying the tank is clean. Check their monitoring equipment. Is it calibrated? Typically I see a sticker attached to the side of the monitor and I'll have the date it was last calibrated and the date the next service is due. I've also seen uh, logs where they record every time they calibrate it. Uh, so there's a variety of documentation that could be used to confirm that that specific monitor um, has current calibration. Ask them what they're gonna be monitoring for. What are the hazards? I mean, typically on a tank pool, it's LEL and oxygen. And then um, there is a, the unified program form that Dave showed you. I'm gonna go into a lot of detail on that form actually in a later slide, but they're gonna generate a clean certification form. We also look for that in the closure report. Talk to the transporter. We talked about if that tank's going off as has or non-has. Make sure you're on the same page. But ask them where it's going. If that tank is destined for reuse, as a contractor or a tank owner, you really need to check with the local agency, the Coupa, to make sure that's even gonna be allowed. Chances are it's coming out because that tank is really, really old and it probably would not meet the criteria for reinstallation. However, if for some rare chance that is the case, this lists the information you need to provide to the local agency. Okay, talk to the geologist. Now the geologist role comes closer to the end of the period the tank inspector is there, but it's good to talk with them up front because I, the first thing I do when I meet with a geologist is I ask them what they're sampling for. And this is a question to test to see if they've read the permit requirements or not. And um, you know, there's actually a pretty large, major, large percentage of geologists that uh, aren't familiar with the sampling plan, and you'll have to go over that with them. But I'm impressed when the geologist says, oh yeah, it's this, that, and the other thing, because that's what the permit says. Or they have the permit with them, and he flips to the page where it's at. That's satisfactory to me, but I really, I will watch the geologist more closer, more closely, if they aren't familiar with the sampling plan. The next question is, do they have the right equipment? Uh, like areas Dave works in, our LA Water Board also requires EPA method 5035. And to collect a sample by that method, you have to have specific sampling equipment. So I'll make sure that they have that because if they don't, because their work is typically towards the end of the removal, they might have some time to work that out. Fortunately, I work in a heavily industrialized area in Los Angeles County and they're able to attain that equipment rather quickly. So I realize that that's a bigger challenge in rural areas, but the more you address those issues up front, the less time you'll be waiting. And then I, I check and see if they have ice in the chest. And the reason why I do that is because you don't wanna pull the samples and find they're putting them in um, to a hot ice chest. The samples are required to be preserved under cooler temperatures, and there's a quick fix to this. If dry ice is going into the tank, just simply chip off a couple of pieces before all the dry ice is put into the tank and use it for the ice chest. If you're at a retail gas station, sometimes that kiosk is still open even though the actual fueling area is closed. Go buy you know, five big gulps of, of ice and put those in the chest. So ask them early so it gives them time to acquire some of the things they may not have. All right, so crane safety issues. I have never operated a crane. I have not been trained on crane safety. Uh, I have operated a backhoe once, but it really was just for fun. So I'm not an expert, but sometimes I'm on a job site and I see the rear stabilizers of a crane jumping up and down. That concerns me. I'm gonna talk to the site safety officer and report that to him. And um, we usually end up stopping and going and talking to the crane operator, and I get typically one of two responses. He either says, uh, yeah, yeah this, is, this is not going right, or he'll explain why it's okay. But commonly, what I find is when the crane is having trouble lifting a tank out of the ground, it's either undersized, 
or the overburden has been adequate, inadequately removed. And so it's important to look in the excavation and see how sufficiently that tank has been unburied. Because if the corners are still stuck under the earth, you know, it's going to present a much greater load on that crane. And if that crane arm is sticking out really far, that crane has less stability and can lift a lower load. But crane operators are supposed to be certified to do their job, so I really have to rely on their expertise. So one of the things I also do with the crane is I look at the condition of the lifting cables or the straps. I had the, the good fortune very early on in my career to witness some really bad tank removals. And the reason why I say that is good is because nobody was hurt. But had I been a more experienced inspector, I may have been able to address this on the front end instead of after the fact. But I've had, I've had cables snap on me and, and they go flying and it's, it's scary. Uh, on that same job, we went through a backhoe and two different sized cranes to get a 30,000 gallon double wall tank out of the ground. So just have a look. When I've brought this to the attention of the site safety officer for um, when I find that the condition of the cables may be frayed or concern me. Uh, they've had a backup set in good condition, so don't be afraid to ask. So the other thing you need to think about with the crane is when the crane is fully extended, 29 CFR regulates the distance that has to be from safety power lines. So at full extension, if a power line is within 20 feet of an electrical line, something further needs to happen. And the section of 29 CFR is provided for here to look at, and there's a variety of options, but one of them generally consists of having a spotter that is in verbal and visual communication with the crane operator. So there's some details to that that I'll defer back to the code for you guys to check out. And then of course you always have the Cal OSHA requirements, but I'm just, I'm, honestly I'm just more familiar with the federal. So you want to observe the crane staging. Is it far back enough from the edge of the excavation? This goes for the backhoe too, whatever piece of equipment is moving it. Um, check the sidewalls. Is it a really unconsolidated material and it's starting to undermine? Or is it like a fine silty clay and really solid and firm? But make sure that the crane is set back far enough from the edge of the excavation. You don't want the front to start sloughing off. So we talked about excavation stability. And um, this is really important because on the, oh goodness, let me go back one. So on the excavation on the left, you can see that there's undermining here. This is a really loose, unconsolidated, sandy material. And you don't want to end up walking across the edge here on cement when it's fully undermined below. That's an unsafe condition. So be careful as you're maneuvering around the excavation, avoid the edges, look for signs of undermining because even if it hasn't collapsed, you can look for cracks in the lips and the sidewall of that excavation. But once you're comfortable with the pre-removal setting as an inspector, then it's time to perform the clean certification. But this is not really how all the timing works out. There's a lot of dynamics and certain contractors are ready to go and others aren't. So you have to have a flexible plan, but in a perfect world, this is, this is how, in my opinion, things would go before I even start to witness the clean certification of the tank. So when we say clean certification, what does clean mean? For years and years and years, I was told, oh, it's just a slang term. It's, a, it's you know, kind of a word we use in the industry, but it turns out that clean actually has a meaning, and that definition is found in API Publication 2015. And it means the removal of all product, vapor, sludge, and residue from a tank and washing, rinsing, and drying a tank so that no product or residues remain on any tank surfaces. And you may think, well, how was I supposed to know to go to API 2015? Well, that's because that section in Title 22 that I brought up at the beginning, Section 67383.3, references the API standards in the regulation. So API publications 2015 and 1604 speak to the details of tank cleaning. So does NFPA, they say NFP 327, but that has been replaced with 326. So as you try and find these codes, keep that in mind. But I provided the web addresses to where you can access both of these codes. Some of the API publications are free, some of them are not. And the NFPA um, subscription, it, you have to pay for. But 
those contain hundreds of pages of requirements. So I talked about what was in the regulations. I talked about five pages total that you should read, but the nitty gritty details of tank cleaning are spelled out in those publications. So who can certify a tank is clean? Title 22 is very specific in who they allow to certify a tank is clean. The first two are the COOPA or the PA. But like Dave said, as a COOPA, you should verify. And I say that in the context to explain that you should never, ever certify. It's my recommendation. Are you legally allowed to do it as a COOPA or a PA? Yes, but we found that to be um, a source of potential liability. So we rely on number three here. One of the following professionals, a California certified industrial hygienist, a California certified safety professional or marine chemist, a California registered environmental health specialist or PE, professional engineer. It also allows for an environmental assessor to do it or a contractor with the proper CSLB licensing and has substance removal certificate. In Santa Fe Springs, we only allow the first three of those to certify tanks, an industrial hygienist, safety professional, or marine chemist, because of our experience. How many of you, by show of hands, were around for the December 22nd, 1998 upgrade deadline? Okay, so, you know, maybe a third of you. Um, we learned a lot of valuable lessons when it came to who could certify a tank, because things were getting bad out there. There was so much opportunity for tank removal work, any contractor with an appropriate license was getting into the tank removal business. And there were really great ones, and there were some really bad ones. And the really bad ones had staff that did not know how to certify an underground tank. In fact, this really happened. I was at a tank removal site, the worker got the, the monitor to measure the interior atmosphere of the tank. See, it's zero, he tells me the LEL is zero. And I look, well, the oxygen was also zero because he didn't turn on the machine. So that's an extreme example, but the other things we ran into is often they didn't have the proper extension on their monitoring device to reach the bottom of the tank because you have to measure top, center, and bottom. And on big tanks, you ought to try and do that at both ends. If you can get in the annular space, test it there as well. So the results of your clean certification must be done on a form. And the Unified Program developed this hazardous waste tank closure certification. And you do not have to use this form, but you must have a form that contains all this information on it. So if a marine chemist has their own form that they use, that's fine. Just make sure they're recording the information that meets that code section. There's also a little, a little box right here that says, if you're the Koopa, did you certify it? And I recommend you mark have, make sure that's marked no. So review that clean certification form with the person who's certifying it. By all means, bring your own equipment. Feel free to verify. verify. Um, but we were just concerned about liability issues and it also elevated the standard and quality of the person performing that certification work. They have to sign it, but keep in mind when they make this form and when they're testing the tank, that certification is only good in that moment. It is only good the moment they test that tank. An hour later, it doesn't really work, but the reality is there's time between when they certify it and when they take the tank out, and that's a reasonable amount of time. What is not acceptable is when they certify it the day before. If they certified the tank yesterday and the tank removal's today, I'll stop that job and I'll wait until they get someone on site to recertify that tank. That's a deal breaker to me. So there's two ways to clean a tank. There's a cut method and there is a method where the tank is not cut. This is stipulated in Title 22. If, if you're cleaning a tank that had flammable vapor or had the potential to have flammable vapors, um, you're required to cut an inspection window into that tank, of course using cold cutting techniques, and you're using a com combustible gas indicator to measure the interior atmosphere. We, there's other types of monitoring um, that can do the job as well, but you're basically recording the oxygen, you want it to be atmospheric level, and the LEL has to be zero. In the uncut method, the difference is there's no inspection window cut. You're really looking through some kind of access port. And in that case, you have to use a Division I, Class I 
light, and a mirror. And look inside the tank as best you can. The Koopa can also require another method, but the key difference is this is where the dry ice requirement, well, I say dry ice, I should say inerting. This is where the inerting requirement comes from. And commonly people use dry ice to inert tanks. Well, I've also read some reviews on the use of nitrogen. We've only had dry ice, it's a little user friendly. Um, but nitrogen as a gas, it can seep out any little hole. These are old tanks. They have corrosion. They have little holes. They have access ports. You know, the, the nitrogen blanket does not really last a long time. And with the dry ice, you're having a continuous regeneration of carbon dioxide because that dry ice is subliming. So let's talk about dry ice. Title 22, those publications I talked about, you'll ultimately read where it says 22 pounds of dry ice is required per thousand gallons capacity of a UST. So title 22, 22 pounds of dry ice. Very easy to remember, right? But what does that look like? So I am fortunate enough that I inspect a dry ice manufacturing facility. In fact, I was there last week. So the 50 pound blocks are basically one foot cubed. And then imagine a 10 pound version of that just being one fifth of that block. But if you had a, your typical 10,000 gallon underground storage tank, you would need 220 pounds of dry ice. And that would be basically four and a half 50 pound blocks. So I talked with my dry ice company and I, I thought, you know, I have seen so many different figures on sublimation rates on the internet. I figured they're gonna know because if they're a dry ice of blinds, that's loss of product and loss of money. And what they told me is that for a 10 pound block of dry ice, you're gonna lose about half of it in a day. If you use pellets, the typical five ounce pellets, the five ounce pellets will be gone the next day. Um, so keep in mind that this is at standard temperature and pressure. If you're out in the desert of Blythe in September and it's 120 degrees, that dry ice could sublime really quickly. But keep in mind, you know, this is what the requirement says for dry ice, but what is the goal of that? It's to inert the tank, displace the vapors, displace the oxygen, remove components of the fire tetrahedron so an explosion is avoided. So allow that dry ice to sublime, generate the carbon dioxide, and then you have to measure it. But you need to be careful because those instruments require oxygen to operate correctly. So you need to know the limitations of your instrumentation and what minimum levels of oxygen they need to operate. And it says you have to plug all the holes except for an 1 8 inch vent. In Santa Fe Springs, one of the lessons we learned from the 1998 upgrade deadline when a lot of tanks were removed is our fire marshal decided that he wanted extra safety measures to ensure flammability is really an eliminated factor. And not only do most of our tanks go out as, as non has through the cut method, we also require dry ice on top of that. And I get a lot of grief from contractors. They don't like it. They feel it's an added expense because the tank is already clean. But the rationale for that is that that tank is moving out of Santa Fe Springs to another jurisdiction. If, you, if the dry ice is in there, it's another level of protection to avoid a flammability issue. So we talked about tank cleaning and if it's certified as hazardous waste or not. And now the tank is coming out of the ground once the tank is certified. So we talked about the crane safety. We addressed that on the front end. And again, I wanna stress the importance of having a clear and free path for that tank to move from the excavation to the truck. There's you know, some people standing underneath there. You wanna ask those, those people to relocate and try and do it in advance. So what about loading the tank onto the back of the truck? You need to be aware of what I call sandwiching. It's where the, the site worker is the meat and the back of the truck or the back of the tank are the bread and if they get squished together, that's not very good for the worker. So in this particular case, this is a small thousand gallon tank. It's coming out with a backhoe. You can see that the, the chain to connect this is very short. The, the ability for this tank to swing and potentially push him back against this first tank that was loaded on is really low. It just doesn't have uh, the radius to do that. However, when you get into cranes, they have really long cables 
they're often lifting larger size tanks and you want to make sure there's a safe distance between the worker and the back of the truck bed. And this goes lightning fast. This is one of the reasons I stay in earshot of the site safety officer because as that tank backs up, they're going to want to manipulate that tank to secure it onto that truck. They need to be positioned on that truck. But as it gets closer and closer to the rear, I'll, I'll make mention to the site safety officer and ask, you know, are you comfortable with, with the location of your worker up against the back of that truck? And anything the site safety officer does or does not do, if I bring it up as an issue, I'm making an inspection note. Okay, so the tank is removed, it's on the back of the truck. You wanna make sure that the loose debris and rocks are removed to the extent that is reasonably possible. How many of you have been on the freeway and have that piece of gravel come flying in your windshield and crack your windshield? That's no fun. So you wanna make sure that all that debris is removed so it can be transported um, without being a road hazard. And we want to see that tank drive off site. We want to see it leave the city of Santa Fe Springs. I mean, we don't follow it out of the boundaries, but we watch it leave the job site. So after the tank is removed, Title 23 says sampling must occur immediately after the removal. And because this talk is on safety and logistics, we're not going to get into the sampling. But I do want to make mention of a relatively new law that passed, and it pertains to AB 1701. AB 1701 um, became effective July 1st, 2013. And basically it changed how COOPAs do UST corrective action. Now, the, U the COOPA must also be a certified LOP to oversee corrective action at a tank removal site. So be aware of that change in authority. The excavation is open. It's great if we could direct removing some of that contaminated soil, but the reality is that directive has to come from the LOP. Now, contractors may volunteer to do it on their own. Just be careful as an inspector that you have um, limitations on your immunity, on your liability immunity if you start actually directing that. So, the tank's out of the ground. The site has been sampled. You want to record that in your agency file, and you also want to record it on the business side. So in our jurisdiction, we give our contractors job cards, and when the tank comes out and the site is sampled, we'll sign off the job card, um, and then we follow it separately to make sure that they submit an underground storage tank removal report. So this is a copy of an attachment we provide in our underground tank removal permits, and it lists the variety of documents that we want to see and the information we want provided in that report. Because of time, I can't go over it individually, but I do want to let you know that I've provided all the code citations that demonstrate, yes, this document is required. The codes referenced are all from Title 23, unless otherwise indicated. But something I do want to point out is having a plot plan to scale. So if your tank goes into corrective action, your LOP or water board is going to make you do a XY um, GPS coordinate location of that tank. But what about the tanks that are clean and don't reach that point? Moving forward into the future, we always get requests for site information under the Public Information Act for um, details on underground tanks to make sure they were removed. It's important that if your site map is not to scale, that you at least superimpose the distance from two property lines to a specific point on that tank. And I'm not talking distance to buildings or distance to different structures. Make sure it's a property line because buildings come and go. And the property lines, it, it, those are more permanent. And then lastly, a common question I get as I'm just getting ready to leave the job site is, can we backfill? Well, that's not really our jurisdiction. It used to be an issue when we had um, corrective action authority, but we would maybe leave it open if it looked like it was contaminated, wait for the samples to come back so you don't have to remove um, additional dirt to get to the point where it's contaminated. But really, that's, that's irrelevant for us. We did not uh, apply to be an LOP. So if they want to fill in that excavation, 
I actually prefer it because now you don't have a gaping hole that someone could potentially fall into, but you need to be aware that there may be building requirements, there could be compaction requirements, and um, it's really up to the business and their contractor to make that decision. So in closing, I just want you to remember that the underground tank removal site is very dynamic. Things happen very quickly and then very slowly. So try to predict what may go wrong in advance and report those safety concerns to the site safety officer. And then always try and work with your contractor, strive for com compliance through cooperation, because ultimately the goal is that we all go home safely and the underground tank is removed safely. And with that, I thank you and we will be opening up for questions.